Hello and welcome. You are tuning into the Community Garden webinar series brought to you by University of Illinois Extension. My name is Nancy Creeth and today I'm bringing you successful community gardening. I partnered with Andrew Holsinger, a fellow horticulture educator, on this part. He will be discussing site-specific considerations and that will be in module two whereas today you're tuning into module one 10 steps to successful community gardens and I will cover the basics of how and why along with 10 steps you could take to be successful so let us start by looking at what a community garden is there's a lot of um, common reasons why, why people build community gardens they certainly look to transform spaces, um, certainly uh, new uses for public spaces or vacant lots may be an eyesore and they'd like to see something more productive done on them. It could be an educational space, building community dialogue and cultural identity, beautification, youth and adult engagement and volunteerism, sometimes even horticulture therapies involved. You, you might see allotment plots or food pantry gardens in which produce is donated. Certainly teaching instruments are common in many community gardens. And then other things like economic development. So some reasons why people decide to, to build community gardens is certainly bringing fresh and local produce, supplementing food budgets, and rebuilding communities. Without a community, it's just a garden. So there has to be people in the neighborhood involved. So this is a collective effort, and it starts with, with people, really. The rewards of community garden could be physical and mental health improvements, and certainly building a family of gardeners. So this could be done in rural areas or even in traditional neighborhood type gardens on vacant lots or common areas and partnering with agencies and schools to repurpose their land. So let us look at these 10 steps that we recommend. Certainly organizing is number one. You'll start this early. Forming a planning committee to help you with organizational task. Identifying mission, goals, resources, sponsors, a site. All of this is going to come into play and it takes a lot of time. Uh, once you have a site selected and your groundwork laid, as far as uh, policy and, and guidelines go, you'll want to start preparing the site materials and um, any grading that might need to be done and also create a design. Beyond that you'll look to your committee to develop rules and guidelines, certainly initiate regular communication, and lastly celebrate the success of all your hard work. So what is the vision? You should sit down before you start building your garden and think about what you want, what is the purpose of your garden? Do you want individual plots, shared spaces, communal gardens for food pantry? Certainly it's, it's beneficial to have school and uh, children involved. A lot of times school ha schools have space and they could work this into the curriculum. It, it's certainly a, a task to involve youth, but it, it is rewarding. You could partner with agencies such as um, University of Illinois Extension or your mis municipality or even neighbors or um, nonprofit organizations. Certainly if you need a water source and, and you're lacking that on your specific site. And then you could also have demonstration gardens or educational gardens and this could be done through more um, public spaces like nature centers or um, botanical gardens. So when we look at those 10 steps, step one is organizing first and organize early. So we recommend a minimum of six months before the season you look to grow in. 
so at least six months sometimes more if you're looking to acquire land it might be up to a year it takes a lot of time to get permission to use land and get it in writing and work out all the insurance and liability issues so keep that in mind um, you'll want to talk your garden up so get flyers out there conduct meetings certainly be collecting um, names of interested people and keeping in contact with them a goal to shoot for is, is really looking at 10 committed people or families. Step two, form a planning committee. These, this would be a group of committed, well-organized people, and you're going to really divide and conquer responsibilities. Subcommittees may include uh, funding and um, acquisition of partners. Uh, organizers, whether it be work days or tool collection days, um, celebration days, things like that. That's always helpful to have a couple people, point person for those particular events. Look for skill sets among your community members. Some may be good at construction, some may be good at organizing paperwork or publicity. So find those niches people have and, and put them to work where they like it and where they'll um, it'll benefit them as long and also the the group um, education a lot of people like to have an educational component and certainly entices people to join your community garden when you have educational events and teach them uh, policy rules and guidelines you'll certainly want to have someone that's willing to draft these up and have them on paper in writing so everybody is clear Identifying mission and goals, step three. So put these in writing. Always look back to them to keep you on track. Having a little simple mission statement is very helpful. What What is the goal? We want to feed a food desert. We want to grow food. Well, maybe you just want to have an ornamental garden. We want to feed the wildlife, restore native areas, and in increase biodiversity. So have those missions. You could certainly be doing both. And then goals, short-term and long-term, set those. You, you, you might not be able to complete everything in the first year, so that's where your short-term and long-term goals come in. Identifying all resources. So this would be people, information, supplies and materials, and funding. And so again, where people are, are num first and foremost, number one, there may be different levels of gardening skills so you could set up a mentor system where beginner gardeners are partnered with more advanced gardeners and they're really the backbone of the garden they're going to make it work look good and be successful um, information so providing them with continuing education opportunities whether it be demonstrations in the garden or classes at a local church or library um, extension websites are great resources so look to U of I extension resources look to your local extension offices and, and seek out um, educational events through us um, and, and when you do your research be sure you're using reputable sources so we have developed a couple handouts that accompany um, these webinars is part one you could contact me I'll give you my contact information at the end of the slides and reach out to me to obtain those handouts also looking at your local library will have some good resources and a lot of times free classes as well supplies and materials so look to your municipalities for access to water or free mulch um, look to local businesses or retailers for discounted seeds plants anything like that wood cinder blocks you know it doesn't hurt to ask so always so always get out there and, and, and seek that um, funding or in-kind donations uh, you know you're gonna rely on this um, self-supporting you know are you going to be able to do this with sales of produce plot fees or membership fees that's that's difficult to raise enough fun funds to be self-supporting so you know consider supplemental funds through grants or in-kind donations or free materials so ways to seek out funding you want to identify and approach sponsors 
Um, these could be uh, local municipalities, churches, retailers, park districts, um, hospitals. Sometimes these larger agencies or organizations have a grant and uh, one component might be community outreach and involvement and in growing of food. So look to those partners to, to seek out land or seek out materials through partnering with those agencies. Again, this could be um, just land usage or in-kind donations, or they may have money and grants, um, and then also be able to supply you with um, construction materials, soil, compost, and certainly looking to extensions for um, expertise. Selecting a site, this is really key. Um, you'll want good quality soil. You'll want full sun for a vegetable garden. You'll need at least six hours of sun. Water is an another one top on the list. Easy, um, safe uh, access to water. Um, also, you know, accessing this for the community members should be easy. Is there parking? Is there handicap accessibility? So consider those um, before selecting your site. Also, what is the site history? Was this a dumping ground? Um, is it too hilly? Do we have permission to use the land? Consider all of those things. And you could also look at aerial maps of your location. So this is a good way to plot out um, your garden, but just using aerial photographs, you can look to get those free from Google Maps. And they also allow you to call out dimensions on these aerial maps if you right click. So again, if you're having trouble obtaining these aerial maps, you could contact me and I could help you with that uh, locating aerial maps for your specific location. Selecting a site. Again, I can't stress this enough, is, is get it in writing. You'll want to set up agreements, um, lease agreements or user agreements. Determine whether or not you need um, insurance and liability. If children are involved, you know, that raises another issue. So make sure all your ducks are in a row when it comes to this uh, policy and paperwork. You know, and then is there going to be any cost um, for water? cost for usage of the land? Is there any necessary improvements like grading of the land or remediating the soil because it's contaminated? There's ways around that and we'll discuss that a little bit and Andrew will also get into site specific considerations in module two of this um, part one of the webinar series. Step seven, part one, was first, you know, creating the design. It could be something more elaborate, like pictured here, um, a detailed drawing of a of a garden. Now, this is a master plan. This was not built in in one year, but built in phases. So first, you know, they put in some rental plots in the pollinator garden, um, followed by putting in an herb garden, uh, a senior accessible garden, and food pantry garden. Yeah, you know, once they had more funding, they were able to put in a tool shed, a compost area, more uh, dwarf fruit trees, and they really partnered with the park district and village to, um, along with a, a school district, to obtain the land and put in uh, underground water. And so this was uh, a collaborative effort that that's really prov provided um, proved to be successful. So when you're looking at um, preparing your site, look at the plot size and arrangement, um, pathways a minimal of three feet wide so you could fill those with compost from year to year. Um, you'll want to go at least five foot wide for um, ADA accessibility. Um, now if the paths are grass, who will be mowing these? You know, if you don't have someone to mow this or it's too much maintenance, you could decide, you know, choose to put a a ground cover, something like Dutch clover, something that doesn't require as much mowing, or uh, simply mulch it. Um, and also consider tool storage, compost area, and certainly easy access to, to water. Just some pictures of examples here where they have demonstration gardens where they are growing um, a row of berry bushes, uh, inviting beneficial pollinators with the bee house, 
looks like they have framework for some hoop houses to maybe extend their growing season during the cooler months, harvesting for food pantry gardens, and allotment plots where people rent these out and grow what they'd like. Part two of step seven will be material preparation. By all means, you'll want to eliminate any existing vegetation, so you don't want to just build your beds right on turf, lawn, or uh, weeds. So you want to suffocate those like they are doing here with cardboard boxes and then putting mulch on top of it. So you want to make sure to overlap these cardboard boxes, remove tape, typically wet it down and then cover it with mulch. Now this will only last a couple years, um, but it does suffocate it nicely versus uh, landscape fabric. Or you could um, remove the sod or weeds by hand or by machine so that's one way to to eliminate it and then build on there but you'll want to have some kind of weed barrier so consider that you don't want to go um, spraying an herbicide on here unless you have a pesticide applicators license so that is law you want to make sure if you you choose to spray in your garden that the person doing it has been licensed and um, passed an exam through the EPA for pesticide applicators and so if you want to learn more about that Andrew will also talk about that in the site specific considerations module 2 and you could always contact me for more information choosing building materials again this will be covered in module 2 but you know consider wood versus cinder block versus compost heaps um, versus other um, kind of innovative systems that are out there like big bag beds or earth boxes or these other types of grow boxes and so that's one way to build up the soil if it's poor soil and if there's contaminants in the soil you could build these raised beds and they're a lot easier to work in and so by all means analyze your soil you'll want to get a soil test um, you could do some physical tests just by looking at the consistency of, of clay versus sand and then also chemical tests would be done by a lab and that would be um, either a nutrient test or a heavy metals test typically you're testing for lead and so we have a list on our website and if you don't have a chance to jot down this website you could always just search U of I extension soil test and the, the labs will come up just make sure you note what you're testing for, either nutrients or lead, and there's a codes there that will tell you what labs test for what. These typically run about $20 to $25 for a basic test. Rules and guidelines. Uh, now management, this is a big part with um, how you're going to um, involve people and get um, guidelines in writing so again having this in writing will benefit everyone so it's nice and clear um, get gardeners in involved when you're developing these it could be more simple to specific you know they could start out simple and as you learn from year to year you might go with more specific rules and guidelines certainly having your application and membership process in place you know uh, at, is there an application process who's collecting those is there a fee involved and in, in who will be maintaining these records from year to year along with assigning plots so this is part one the second part would be more of the um, rules and guidelines what are the issues that come up so it could be garden issues as far as weed tolerance allowable structures as you see here pictured on the top you're going to allow structures like this more elaborate mini hoop houses to remain through the winter and are you going to allow people on site for winter or do you have opening and closing dates for the season allowing perennial crops things like strawberries rhubarb asparagus is that something you wish to see that those take a you know a few years to get going or do you want to simply close the garden and put the the beds to rest for the winter pesticide usage again organic or not you'll want to have a pesticide applicators license people issues so things that might come up are pets on site or children on site running around so we'll have some guidelines in place you know you'll always want to have um, children accompanied by an adult um, certainly you'll see some theft and vandalism in these gardens from time to time so 
you know, what, what's um, the plan if that happens or, you know, if a bed is destroyed and people rented this out from you, you know, how, how will they be reimbursed or what could you do as far as uh, policy goes? You know, consider cigarette, drug, alcohol use, you know, how will those be handled and what are the consequences of violating those rules? Regular communication, this is another important step, step nine. Um, so getting the word out there, again, you know, recruit early and often. And after you have your, your group, you'll want to have regular meetings um, accompanied by educational programs to entice people to come, you know, see which days and times work best for your community members. You might have multiple meetings, different days and times to accompany all. Um, and you know certainly get out there on social media and an email blast or a newsletter to, to keep in that constant communication and here is a lovely example of this garden advertising their um, per art performances in the garden so inviting the community to, to see a, um, a theater performance in the garden so having a community bulletin board along with the suggestion box is helpful directly in the garden Last but not least, certainly celebrate your success. So making up baskets like this to go to food pantries and along with recipe sheets. And along those lines, you know, we have everybody make a basket to donate it, but also harvest and, and make a, a feast uh, to celebrate and eat in the garden, bring recipes, certainly invite media. That's always a bonus and, and a way to get the word out and, and potential for more members and donations and so this is really important you know you put a lot of hard work in here so be sure to celebrate this and invite all that were involved here are some resources to wrap it up um, American Community Garden Association has a wonderful website a fellow extension Missouri extension has a wonderful community garden toolkit it's more extensive and goes into great detail of just the the tip of the iceberg of what we covered today this will have everything laid out it's probably 20 25 page booklet and it's free online and again you could contact me for our handouts just to um, give credits to some collaborators and again, Andrew Holsinger will be covering Module 2 of this Part 1 of the series, and that's in, in relation to soil, water, building materials, pesticide use, so please tune in for that. And here's my contact information. Again, my name is Nancy Kreeth. I'm up in the Cook County area based outside of Chicago, and so feel free to contact me. I'm happy to help you or put you in touch with your local extension educator and feel free to reach out to me for that handout. Thank you for joining me today. Goodbye.